Thank you. Mr. Chancellor, it is my pleasure to present to you John Howard McCall McBain, a distinguished McGill alumnus, brilliant entrepreneur, humanitarian, and a very generous Canadian. As a recent McGill graduate and the university's 136th Rhodes Scholar, I'm very honored to be here today to present this recognition to John McCall McBain. As a McGill, Oxford, and Harvard alumnus, Rhodes Scholar, and visionary philanthropist, McCall McBain exemplifies the qualities of academic excellence, determination, leadership, and generosity that so many young people like myself aspire to today. During his three years at McGill, McCall McBain was very active in the student community. As you heard earlier, serving as president of the McGill Student Union and running Welcome Week and Winter Carnival. As an alumnus, he has continued his interest in student life at McGill and found ways to foster excellence and leadership in today's generation through the creation of scholarships, fellowships, and student aid initiatives, including the McCall McBain Fellowships in the Faculty of Arts and the McCall McBain Prestige Entrance Scholarships. Not only has McCall McBain enriched the educational experiences of students here at McGill, but he has also extended this support across the globe through the establishment of the McCall McBain Foundation, created with his wife Marcy in 2006. Since its formation, the foundation has made donations of $200 million to a diversity of important global development initiatives in health, education, and the environment. In addition to large-scale philanthropic initiatives, McCall McBain has also demonstrated the power of smaller transformative gifts by establishing local schools and medical clinics in West Africa. A proud native of Niagara Falls, Ontario, he has also provided early stage support for the careers of Canadian Olympic and World Championship medalists, Damien Warner, Alexandre Bilodeau, and McGill graduate Jennifer Hale. More recently in 2013, John McCall McBain made philanthropic history in providing the largest single gift to the Rhodes Trust in its 110-year history, allowing the Trust to strengthen the existing Rhodes Scholarships and to expand its reach in the future to students in China, Brazil, and Russia. This exemplary gift will, will allow students from around the world to continue to benefit from the Rhodes Scholarship for the next 100 years making McCall McBain the second century founder of the Rhodes Trust after Cecil Rhodes. As Miguel's most recent Rhodes Scholar, I believe that this gift is truly an investment in a genuinely global future, in the leadership of thousands of young individuals from all over the world, so that together we can develop the intellectual skills to lead change in the myriad issues that the world currently faces. For this extraordinary vision, and on behalf of all of the McGill students, Rhodes Scholars, and individuals around the world who have and will continue to benefit from your incredible generosity, I express my gratitude and my conviction that there is no one more deserving of this, McGill's highest honor. Mr. Chancellor, I present to you John Howard McCall McBain that you may confer upon him the degree of Doctor of Law, Honoris Causa. Ladies and gentlemen, I now invite Dr. John McCall McBain to deliver the convocation address. Dr. McCall McBain. <laughs> Chancellor Arnold Steinberg, Principal Suzanne Fortier, Chancellor Emeritus 
Richard Pound, Interim Dean Mort Zislawski, distinguished guests, families, friends, and fellow graduating students. This is a happy day. Une journée très joyeuse pour votre famille, vos amis, et pour vous, la promotion 2014. As you heard earlier, I'm a McGill graduate myself, and I fondly remember my three years here. The hard winters, especially hard I heard this year. The renaissance of spring, my graduation, where I also spoke as valedictorian, and my time as president of McGill Student Society. Je me souviens aussi que les Canadiens ont gagné le Scoop Stanley en 1978 et 1979, deux de mes trois années à McGill, quand j'étais étudiant à McGill. Et 2014, c'était plus difficile. <laughs> Now, let me take a moment just to challenge you today at your graduation. Now, what is all this talk I've heard about risk? When I was a kid in Niagara Falls, Canada, my parents told me not to take risks. You may fall, hurt yourself, or be embarrassed. Your parents were right when you were younger, but they're not right now. I've learned over and over again that risk is not only good for you, it is also good for our society. And you have a duty to society to take these risks. Let me explain. So what is risk? So I tried to look at risk more closely and it's three letters. The first two letters are really two elements of risk. R of risk is for responsibility. By taking risks, you are taking on responsibility to achieve results. Responsibility is also reversing the attitude where the things you see that need to be changed, you don't do anything about. Internalize, as a graduate, some of these issues of the world and some of our problems so you too can see them clearly and do something about them. The eye of risk is for integrity. You must be true to yourself to make risk worth taking and for the results to have the positive benefits of so for society. Is what you're planning to do the right thing? Now the last two letters of risk are really things you do not get by taking risks. And you must be aware of this. The S is for security. And for sure, by taking risks, you will not get any security to settle in the way things used to be. However, as I will explain later, you are the last group in the world that needs security. And the K, K is for kudos. Do not expect any kudos from others when you take risks. There is an unfortunate saying, which I'll ascribe to Tulio Sadrashi, but I'm sure it comes from others, but, which says, no good deed goes unpunished. So when taking risks and doing the right thing, applause tend to be withheld, and the same will probably be true for my speech. So the reason I wanted to talk to you today about risk is that you, the graduates in this room, of one of the greatest universities in the world, and probably the greatest public university in the world, are sitting at the magic confluence of great responsibility and low downside. What we need is people like you, young leaders in our society, to take risks for two reasons. First, only by taking risks will society advance and overcome its present problems. We want people to take risks who can provide the best solutions, and no one is better placed than you, the graduates here today, to take those risks and to better our society. But conveniently, the graduates in the room today who should take these risks are also the ones with the lowest downside in taking these risks. Now, many take risks out of desperation, and their downside is terrifying. But let's take a look for a second at your downside of taking a risk, like being an entrepreneur or starting your own social enterprise. If you totally fail, you'll probably get a job. It may be at 80% of your former salary, and maybe one rung down in the corporate ladder. Or it may take a little longer to pay back your student loans. But your risk is limited. Your risk is not starvation. Indeed, your downside is relatively insignificant compared to the overall benefit to our society by people taking risks. The changes brought about by people taking risks will change our society. 
And you also, luckily, learn from risk, from taking risk, and you learn from failure. As Nietzsche said, that which does not kill us makes us stronger. So if the people who can provide the most benefits of taking risk to our society conveniently are also the people with the lowest downside to take risks, if we and those people who should take these risks and have the lowest downside will not take those risks, who should take them? Will it be those with the least potential to provide good benefits for society and have the greatest downside? I think that's unlikely. Now, two other things I think you should think about when you're thinking about risk. One is that pride is the enemy of proper risk-taking. If you do something and you fail, you will hurt your pride. But you know what? You'll still get up the next morning and have breakfast, and you'll find another job, and your family will still be with you. For example, on a very personal note, after uh, receiving the Rhodes Scholarship in Oxford, Oxford, I applied to Harvard Business School, and I applied to 37 scholarships to have my way paid at Harvard Business School. I couldn't afford to go there. I lost 36 scholarships. And let me tell you, 36 rejection letter can really hurt your pride. However, I won one scholarship, the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation Scholarship, and that paid my way through Harvard Business School. So today, people say, isn't that the lucky guy who won that full scholarship to Harvard Business School? No one mentions today, isn't that the sucker that lost 37 scholarships? <laughs> so luckily, my pride didn't limit my potential. The second enemy of risk or risk-taking is over-analysis. It's a real enemy of risk-taking. There comes a point, a point in your spreadsheet potentially, when your assumptions are so great that no matter what analysis you do, the added value will be very little or potentially negative. When you analyze risk, you'll usually determine if it's a no or if you're in doubt. It's very seldom when you do your analysis that it comes up with a clear yes. And so you seldom get the clear yes, so what do you do? What I say is when in doubt, act. So your choices today and in the future are choices where you will not be certain, where you will not know exactly what to do or what should be done. Lots of people will tell you, you sh what should be done or what you should do in your career or where you should go or what you should go into and all, or where all your friends are, are going or what you, all your friends are looking at, looking at. However, you want to look at the ideas, the jobs, the opportunities that don't come on the campus, the companies that are not recruiting at McGill, the projects that nobody in your class has heard of yet. Yes, you want to take on those unknown opportunities that you're going to find out on your own. You want to open the doors that are unopened. You don't want to run through the doors that have already been opened for you. So my conclusion today is that if you want to make a difference in the world, I don't have the magic answer, but I have sure learned one thing. It's not by following everyone else. So in closing, take risks, be happy, and yes, I did see the YouTube happy video, and congratulations to the class of 2014. Bravo à la promotion 2014. Merci.